Hey everyone, welcome to the question show, the last question show of 2021. I hope you had a good year. Here's to an exciting next year. I'm gonna be taking one week off, so there'll be a one week break, and then we'll be back into 2022 with new question shows. As always, I do these shows every Monday, 5 p.m. Pacific. So if you want to join live, you can. There should be an announcement for the next one somewhere on the channel. Um, but if a question pops in your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Coach Adam, how can Starship go to the moon or Mars without a proper landing pad? The regolith would be forced back up into the engines upon landing and takeoff and risk catastrophic damage. Is there thought being given to this problem? That is a great question. And most people haven't this hasn't really occurred to them that the regolith on the surface of the moon is incredibly dangerous for the spacecraft. And so when you think about say the Apollo missions, you had the Apollo missions, you had the landing module, and then you had the ascent module that was sitting on top of the landing module. And so the landing module would come down, it would fire its rocket, it would kick up a whole pile of regolith, and then it would land, then the astronauts would get out and they would do their science on the surface of the moon, and then they get back into the ascent module, and then they would kick off and so the ascent module had never had its rocket at risk from the regolith that's being kicked up from the surface of the moon. And this stuff is very damaging. And so there's some really interesting research that's been coming out from, say, Phil Metzger. I did an interview with him a couple of years ago about this, that when rockets land on the moon, they kick up this regolith. And in the low gravity of the moon, this stuff goes into orbit and lasts in orbit for a while. And so any spacecraft that's going to attempt to land after say, a spacecraft has already just landed is going to have to go through this quite damaging stream of particles that have been kicked up to space. And there's going to be a limit to how many spacecraft can actually land until it just becomes too dangerous. Now, I'm not entirely sure how much damage say if Starship is landing on its thrusters, and as it gets closer and closer to the regolith, it's going to do more damage or if the regolith is just going to get blown away. But having a landing pad on the surface of the moon is going to be vital. And there's been some great ideas. One idea, of course, is just like the first spacecraft that goes, you then build a landing pad out of lunar regolith, you just build concrete out of the lunar regolith. There's lots of ideas have been tested out here on Earth, and they should work on the moon, it's just you'd have to take a machine to go and actually build the landing pad. The other idea is that you have a material like a spray that is held by the lander. And as the lander is approaching the surface of the moon, this material sprays down and coats the regolith on the moon and hardens it. And then the propellant and the heat from the propellant sort of instantly bakes a landing pad underneath the lander as it lands on the moon. And so you give yourself a nice firm landing, you'd minimize the amount of regolith that you're kicking up into space. But for long term, visiting to the moon, we're going to need, uh, we're going to need like landing pads. Bob Driscoll, is it possible to have two planets of nearly equal size orbiting each other so that they also orbit a star similar to the way the Earth and the moon orbit the sun? Yeah, absolutely. So we don't have any of these sort of imagine two Earth sized worlds orbiting around each other as they're orbiting their star. But it is theoretically possible. And the closest thing we have to a double planet here in the solar system is Pluto and its moon Charon. And so when you think about any planet and its moons, the moons aren't orbiting the planet, what's actually happening is that the moon and the planet are orbiting a common center of gravity between the two of them. For the Earth and the moon, the common center of gravity happens to be inside the Earth. And so it looks like the moon is orbiting around the Earth. But when you go to Pluto and Charon, that common center where they're orbiting around is actually outside of Pluto's surface. So they're sort of orbiting around this point in space. And you can imagine where the two planets are more evenly balanced, you've got two planets orbiting around each other as they're orbiting around 
the star. Now, I don't really know how stable that configuration would be if you had a lot of other planets in the solar system. Like we know that Jupiter is quite a bully gravitationally and is always trying to kick the other planets around and who knows what kind of mayhem it's done in the past. And I wonder if Jupiter being relatively close to say two Earths, a binary planet Earth, it would let that stand and it wouldn't just break them apart, cause them to smash into each other or something. And that's why Pluto, which is so far away from anything else has this stable configuration. But we see double objects all the time. We see asteroids with moons, we see Pluto dwarf planet with another moon that might as well be another dwarf planet, we see double stars. So theoretically, yeah, and you can imagine what some of the implications of that like you would have like depending how far apart they are, but the planet would be having regular eclipses of one another, which would be really weird, depending on how they're they're lined up orbitally. But for an alien civilization, like if we were living on a planet Earth, and there was another planet, it would be relatively easy to go and visit it, especially if it had a thick atmosphere. Like the moon was really tricky to go to partly just because there's no atmosphere. And so there's no easy way to land on the moon without a propulsion system. But if there was like another planet Earth, you could just fly to this other planet, and then you could go into the atmosphere and descend and land and visit with the locals. So it's a great idea. Obviously, it's a great science fiction idea. And I can't wait for someone to find one of these for real somewhere in the universe. Andrew D. There was not much certainty coming from this conversation. I wonder if it's even possible to come up with unquestionable results. Now this question came from an interview that I was doing with Andrea Lynn about using uh, a planet hunting technique to find planets around other stars. But it's a it's a great comment. And I and I wanted to I tagged it as a question, even though it's really sort of a comment, but that I think one of the things that we need to be really comfortable with as fans of space and astronomy is this world of uncertainty. And I think as you learn more about the universe, as you learn more about the way the telescopes, the techniques, the scientists, the missions, what everybody's doing to try and find stuff out there in space, you really are starting to see how difficult it is, how slowly nature gives up its secrets, and what is going to be the way forward step by step incrementally. And it's funny, because like maybe 10 years ago, I thought, okay, we're going to find Earth 2.0 any day now. And maybe the Kepler mission was going to be the one that would have found it. But now, as I see things like say, the possible discovery of the chemicals of life on Venus, and then how difficult scientists are having to try and confirm this, I sort of think about how difficult it's going to be to find a planet just orbiting another sun like star at the same distance as the Earth does in the habitable zone of that star to scan the atmosphere of that planet and unambiguously know that there is some kind of chemical there that is evidence that there's life on that planet it's going to be really hard. And even though we've got really powerful new telescope, James Webb is coming going to be coming online, we've got the extremely large telescope, we've got these incredible new instruments that are all coming online, this search for life, this search for other planets is going to be difficult. And it's going to take a long time. And even when astronomers say, Okay, we found one, others are going to overturn their results and go No, you didn't. And so I would be amazed if we find conclusive evidence that there are habitable planets outside of the solar system in my lifetime, <laughs> which I know sounds crazy. But I but you know, I've been doing this job now for closing in on a quarter century. And I'm starting to get a sense of just how long things take. But I'm in it. I'm in it. For, I'm in it for the for the journey. And I'm really enjoying each discovery that gets made and putting them all into context. But I'm also managing my expectations about what we're going to find and how long it's going to take. So yeah, James Moore, can a black hole absorb dark matter? In theory, sure. Um, it all depends on what dark matter is. But the main assumption that astronomers have is that dark matter is a particle of some type. And anything that goes into a black hole, stays inside of a black hole. The tricky thing about dark matter is that 
astronomers think that dark matter, even though it's like it's some kind of particle, it doesn't interact with regular matter or itself very easily. And so when you have regular matter, say you've got gas and dust that's swirling around this black hole, this gas and dust is bonking into each other and slowing itself down, it forms this big accretion disk, and then this accretion disk spirals in and goes into the black hole, because this material can kind of collide with itself and apply friction across the entire process. And that's what helps drag that material inside the black hole. But the thinking is, is that dark matter doesn't have any kind of cross section like two particles of dark matter could fly towards each other and essentially pass through each other or get I don't know a plunk length apart and still not actually bounce off each other. And so you wouldn't get dark matter accreting around a black hole in the same way. Of course, one of the other theories is that dark matter is actually black holes that there were black holes formed at the beginning of the universe, these primordial black holes. And so can a black hole absorb dark matter when that dark matter is a black hole? Yeah. Scott's astrophotos. Will they redo the Hubble deep field with the James Webb telescope? Absolutely. Um, I, I've talked to some people, some researchers working with James Webb and asked this exact question, uh, probably here on the channel a few times if you search for it. So one of the plans eventually will be do the James Webb version of the Hubble deep field. And so if you don't know what the Hubble deep field, of course, this was this time when they took the Hubble Space Telescope, and they stared at a seemingly empty chunk of space for days. And over time, after all that data was gathered, they had this image, this very famous image that contained tons and tons of galaxies that even a spot that seemed to have nothing in it actually contained tons of galaxies that were at varying distances from us until literally the beginning of the universe. And when Hubble wants to take an image of an object that's really far away, like 500 million years after the Big Bang, then it has to scan this single spot for a long, 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 long time, or it can use a gravitational microlens word, there's some galaxy cluster in between Hubble and the distant object. And so this galaxy cluster acts like a natural lens to allow this object to be more visible. But James Webb is going to be so much more powerful. And so it's going to be able to look in any direction and see the first galaxies as they were forming in any direction that it wants. And it'll do it a lot more quickly than Hubble can. And so one of the plans eventually will be this James Webb version of the deep field, where they will stare at a seemingly empty part of space and try to see what they can see. And what they're expecting to see is this time at the universe, just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, when the first galaxies were coming together, when small dwarf galaxies were merging together to form larger galaxies. And that should give us a much better sense of how the early universe came together. Banana ham. Have you guys already talked about the water found on Mars? I haven't yet here. But I talked about it on astronomy cast and I talked about it on the weekly space hangout. But I just haven't talked about it here on this channel. And this is a really incredible discovery. I think it's one of the biggest discoveries of 2021. And so I'm treating it like a question. Um, and that is that uh, astronomers use the European ExoMars spacecraft to detect the presence of hydrogen and oxygen, essentially the constituents of water at the bottom of the Valles Marineris trench on Mars. And Valles Marineris is the biggest deepest valley in the entire solar system incredibly deep. And they think that there is upwards of 40% water by volume in this regolith at the bottom of this valley. And that's huge, because this region is very close to the equator. Like, obviously, we know there's water at Mars's north and south poles. But people want to explore near to the equator. And to find that amount of water is huge. There's a lot of other benefits as well. Like if you're going to go down and explore or maybe even set up some kind of camp at the bottom of Valles Marineris, you're at the bottom of a much more atmosphere. And so you would have an easier time trying to pressurize your environment, your suits, etc. Also, the walls of the valley would help protect you from a lot of the radiation that's coming in on the sides. And so you'd have a reduced radiation load while you're spending your time outside and water 
is incredible. And even if it's not water, even if it's some other oxygen hydrogen compound, the fact that those two atoms are there in that regolith means that it can be extracted and turned into fuel and drinking water and breathable air and all kinds of other stuff. So it's a really exciting discovery. And I hope someone is able to confirm it. More questions in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons, Gary Golden, Marcel Yan Krigsman, Philip Shane, Joe McTee, Jonathan Slocum, and the rest of our 791 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Thomas Anfang. Is the Starship program just a modern day version of NASA's space transportation system from the 1970s? What lessons have SpaceX learned from the economic failures of the space shuttle? It's funny, like if you go back and look at the original space shuttle documents, the original plans that they were starting to put together back in say the 1960s and 70s, the space shuttle that we see today is very little similar to what they originally wanted to do. So the original plan was to have this giant carrier vehicle that looked sort of like the space shuttles main fuel tank, but with wings. And then the actual orbiter spacecraft would sit on top of this. And then maybe would have booster rockets as well. And then this thing would take off vertically, fly up to a certain point, then the main fuel tank would detach and fly back down and land on a runway. And then the orbiter would fly to space, maybe with a couple of boosters, which would detach, and then it would finish off its mission and return. And so the space shuttle, the original idea was to try to make a two stage reusable rocket system. And of course, then more requirements were thrown on and it may be that it was just never possible. And so they switched to having the orbital be reusable, the booster rockets be reusable, but the main fuel tank was disposed of with each launch. So the thinking was there, the plan was there. And so now with Starship having a propulsive landing, like that's the difference is that Starship, which is based on the technology of the Falcon rockets, is that it has a propulsive landing system. And that required modern computers, there just wasn't enough computing power back in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, to be able to handle the complexities of of having a rocket land, move its engines to be able to have it land vertically again on a, on a on the ground or on a on a drone ship in the middle of the ocean that's rocking back and forth. So it's funny when you go back and look and I highly recommend this, like if you go back and look at historical NASA documents, there's a ton of them. NASA has a whole website dedicated to its history. And you look at some of the older ideas back in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, every great idea that's being thought of tested today is in those documents, they thought of all this stuff. It's just that some of the ideas were considered too complicated, too technical, too expensive, too risky. And so they didn't develop them any further. So with Starship, things have come full circle. It's the dream is to make a fully reusable two stage rocket. And finally, maybe someone, some company will pull this off. Brad Kilshaw, if the universe started with the Big Bang, isn't a big crunch the only possible ending? No, no, there's many possible endings to the Big Bang. We know that at some point, 13.8 billion years ago, all of the matter that we see in the observable universe was far more densely collected together. And then something caused this region of space to become less and less dense over time. Back in the beginning, all the material in the observable universe was compressed into an area that was, I don't know, small, a few centimeters across, I forget the exact number. And that's just the observable universe. I mean, the unobserved universe could go on for an infinite amount in all directions. And so it's just that the universe was more dense back at that time. And then some event kicked off this expansion that we see today. And back in say the 19, I think, oh, I'm gonna say it was the 80s. Anyway, astronomers set out to figure out what is the ultimate fate of the universe. And so what they did was they measured essentially the expansion rate of the universe and tried to figure out is the universe slowing down over time? 
And so that's the big crunch The universe is expanding, like it had this initial boost. And then everything is moving apart. And then it's slowing down, slowing down, and eventually the mutual gravity of everything is going to pull it all back together. And you get this big crunch. But another possibility is that the all the material in the universe is expanding away from each other. And it's expanding at just the right speed that at an infinite amount of time, it will slow to a halt. And the other possibility is that it's expanding so quickly that it's just not gravitationally bound, it's on its way. And there's no amount of time that you would have to wait, you could wait for it to fall back into itself. And what they found is it was the middle one, that essentially the shape of the universe is such that the expansion is going to end at an infinite amount of time with the universe just coming to a stop. But then of course, in 1998, astronomers discovered dark energy. And this was this weird, mysterious force that is accelerating the expansion of the universe. And so now all those other ideas are out, because now you've got this additional boost that is speeding up the expansion of the universe. And so the future of the universe that we see today, the one that is appears most likely is that all the galaxy clusters in the universe are going to accelerate away from each other faster and faster and faster, fall over the cosmic horizon and be gone forever. And only around the Milky Way, Andromeda, our local galaxies were locally gravitationally bound to them will form one big large galaxy, and then all the stars will die. And then all the black holes will die. And eventually it'll just be this cold dead thing in the middle of of emptiness, and it will cool down to the background temperature of the universe. And that's the heat death of the universe. John Murano. I wonder if greenhouse gases that terraform Mars could also absorb solar radiation so you get a two for protection. So one of the ideas to terraform Mars to make Mars more habitable and live livable is to put very powerful greenhouse gases into the atmosphere of Mars, the kinds of stuff that's been banned like chlorofluorocarbons that have been banned here on Earth because of the damage they're doing to the ozone layer, not to mention how bad of greenhouse gases they are, take that stuff to Mars, build factories, pump it into the Martian atmosphere, and thicken the atmosphere and warm it up. And theoretically, within a few centuries, few thousand years, who knows, you would thicken up the atmosphere of Mars to the point that it would warm up and then a lot of the carbon dioxide that's locked away, a lot of the gases, a lot of the water that's frozen would start to melt, and you would thicken the atmosphere more and more naturally. And yeah, if you thicken the atmosphere on Mars, you would provide more protection from radiation from space, but it's not great. Like it's not as good as a great big magnetic field that is surrounding your planet, redirecting all of the particles to the poles so they don't damage you. But more atmosphere is more protection, but not the best protection. But yeah, you would it would be a twofer. Altapan Altapan, if dark matter doesn't exist, what will happen? It's pretty hard to make the case that dark matter doesn't exist at this point. Like at this point, astronomers have detected dark matter in many different ways using many different techniques and have measured it very precisely. They do these gravitational lensing surveys of the entire universe. They essentially look at the universe and watch how light is warped and tweaked as it's traveling vast distances across the universe. And they're able to map out places of essentially invisible gravity, which is acting like a gravitational lens out there in the universe and showing that this hidden mass is there. They have been able to measure the rotation rate of galaxies. They're able to detect galaxies that have only dark matter, they've been able to detect galaxies that have no dark matter. So to come at this point and say, Yeah, but what if dark matter doesn't exist is like, say you're driving down the road, and your car is making a horrible banging sound, and you don't know what it is, like it's just making this knocking banging sound from the engine, and your buddies in the car with you. And you're like, God, I wonder what that sound is. Maybe it's my engine, maybe it's my brakes, maybe it's my transmission. And your buddy's like, what if there's nothing wrong with your car? but like you're hearing the sound and your buddy's like, what if there's no sound? What if you're not hearing anything? Like, you know, it's there, you know, there's something there's not a good sound coming out of your car, and you need to take the mechanic and you need to figure it out. And that's the same thing as dark matter astronomers know it's there. 
they've done the measurements, they've they just don't know what it is. But like, that's the same process as you hearing a weird sound coming out of your car, you know, it's there, you just don't know what it is yet. But that's the next step. And so astronomers are now trying to figure out what it is. So I can't imagine a scenario that it doesn't exist, because it's been so well mapped, and calculated and observed. But what it could be is there's an enormous number of ideas for what it could be. And now it's just a matter of testing out these ideas one after the other carefully, laboriously, until one is able to explain what dark matter is and every observation that gets made seems to hold up. And it makes predictions about the universe that are then observed, then that would be the point where we would start to know what dark matter is. Nick Vigerfield, what makes the regolith of Mars and our moon different from the Earth's soil? Yeah, it's funny, we don't use the word soil or dirt or earth, we use the term regolith. And, and I guess I sort of got that. Like, I, I used to use dirt and soil and earth and stuff as a term and lots of scientifically minded people gave me a hard time about it. And so now I've gotten very careful about how I describe the crushed up rock that is found on the surface of the moon and Mars. And that's exactly what it is. So if you go and pick up a scoop of dirt on the moon, the regolith, and you examine it under a microscope, all you will see is tiny shards of smashed up lava rock. And that is just meteorites have been bombarding the surface of the moon for billions of years and have just churned up the surface of the moon into this just small, glassy material. And if you go to Mars, it's a little different because Mars has wind and it has had water in the past, but it's also had its share of volcanoes and meteorites striking the surface and grinding it up as well. But again, if you look in a microscope at the Mars regolith, you're just going to see little rocks, sand. And the difference is here on Earth, when we talk about our soil, it is small rocks, but it's also organic material, you've got decayed leaves and you know, it's called hummus, hummus, hummus. Um, one is chickpeas, and the other is decaying matter. But um, yeah, so you've got sand and rock, but you've also got this organic material that's mixed in and we need this organic material to grow plants here on Earth. Without that organic material, plants can't grow. And so you won't be able to grow anything in lunar regolith or Martian regolith until you get that organic material mixed in, you got to start composting, watch uh, the Martian to see uh, how how to grow potatoes on Mars. Christopher, does the search for habitable exoplanets ignore the possibility of gas giants with habitable moons? Are there future prospects for seeing large exo moons with enough resolution to learn the mass, etc? I did a great interview with Dr. Alex Tichy here on my channel all about the search for exomoons and what that means for life. And could you have Earth sized world orbiting around gas giants? And how would we find them and so on? So I'll put a link to the interview and you can check that out. It's it was great. It'll answer all your questions about exomoons. Morpheus dream. Hey, Fraser after James Webb, what missions should we be looking forward to? I mean, there's so many, I would say, I mean, not necessarily missions, but the big stuff that you're gonna to want to watch in 2022, we should see first light for the Vera Rubin Observatory, this previously was known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. And I think this is like my favorite telescope idea. It's going to be scanning the entire night sky from the southern hemisphere every three days. And it's going to be looking for anything that changes. So it's going to find asteroids and comets. It's going to find planet nine, it's going to see supernovae, it's going to see variable stars, it's going to find things that we didn't even know we were looking for. Theoretically, it's going to be able to find planets. So anything that changes in the night sky, Vera Rubin is going to be the machine that finds it. I would say that's the, the thing in 2022 that I'm most excited about. But we should see the first launch of the space launch system. We'll see. Looks like they, they're going to have another delay. We should see the flight of Starship to orbit in 2022. And then sort of around the corner, we've got the Titan Dragonfly, which is going to be sending a nuclear powered helicopter to fly around the skies on Titan, we're going to see the Europa Clipper, a mission sent specifically 
to search for the geysers and try to analyze the potential geysers on Europa, we're going to see the Europeans juice mission, which is going to be visiting the other icy moons, including Enceladus. it's going to visit Ganymede, and Callisto and Europa, and mostly studying Ganymede, which is one of the most exciting places in the solar system. There's like too many missions to mention by 2026, we should be getting the extremely large telescope, which is going to be a 39 meter telescope, which is just going to be a mind bendingly large telescope should be capable of observing Earth sized worlds, orbiting sun like stars, like directly, like it'll just take a picture and go, there's another Earth. I've been waiting a long time for a lot of these missions. And now here we are 2021. A lot of these are just a couple of years away. The late night gamer could a black hole be survivable with solar systems inside perfectly safe? Probably not. But it depends on the size of the black hole. So we know that when you have some compact object, I mean, just Earth is a good example, right? the Earth is an object with gravity. And if an object gets too close to the Earth, it enters what's called the Roche limit. And that's a region where essentially the gravity pulling on the front side of this object is different, so different from the gravity pulling on the back side of this object that it gets torn apart. And then those pieces get torn apart, and they get torn apart. And so as a moon say got really close to the Earth, it would get torn apart and torn apart and torn apart and just go into orbit. And then it would crash down onto the surface of the moon. And the same thing would happen around a black hole. If you got too close to a black hole, the gravity pulling on your feet would be stronger than the gravity pulling on your head and you'd be pulled in half. And then the gravity pulling on your feet would be stronger than the gravity pulling on your torso, and then that would be pulled in half. And so you would just be turned into a stream of particles as you would go into the black hole. And that would suck for you and it would suck for the planet you live on. Obviously, the planet would just be smeared out and turned into like a solar system could not survive. But if a black hole is bigger, then the event horizon is smoother. And the tidal forces on you are less and less extreme. And so for a stellar mass black hole, if you got really close, yeah, you get torn apart. But if you had a supermassive black hole, something say, the size of the one at the heart of the Milky Way, then you could pass in through the event horizon of that black hole and not really know that you were experiencing these tidal forces. But as you got closer and closer to the center, you would. And that's where you're going. You're inevitably heading towards the center of the black hole. And so if you had like some of the most massive black holes in the entire universe, ones that are billions of times the mass of the sun, then you could imagine a planet passing into the event horizon and orbiting around inside this event horizon and not being torn apart. But there's going to be tons of radiation and other forces, gravitational forces and stuff that are going to be acting on it. And so that would probably still make it for a, a bad day. But if you could stay outside the black hole, they actually serve very useful things. One of the coolest ideas that I've ever seen, like a place to have the most population possible would be you would have like a supermassive black hole. And then you would have smaller black holes orbiting around that supermassive black hole. And then you would have planetary systems orbiting around those black holes. And it would be gigantic and stable. And you could eventually come up with a solar system with tens of 1000s of planets all orbiting black holes and relatively close to each other in perfect stability for a long period of time. And maybe that's what some future civilization will do. But no, you don't want to park your home inside a black hole. All right. Well, those are all the questions that I had this week. I wish all of you a happy safe holidays. And I look forward to seeing you again in 2022. All right, we'll see you next year. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights, and links you can find out more. Go to universedata.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all my videos are also available in handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks to all the moderators and a special thanks as always to Chad Weber and Nancy Graziano.